good afternoon or good morning to our friends over in Western Australia. It's a, a pleasure to have you here for session one of a two-part webinar on the updated Osroads Guide to Road Design Part 3. This webinar is proudly brought to you by Osroads and the objective is to take our listeners through the major changes that have occurred with this update. My name is Angela Ratz and I will moderate this webinar and provide you with technical support if required. May I please have your attention for a few short moments as I cover off a few housekeeping items. Ladies and gentlemen, we are recording today's session and will be sharing the footage with you on conclusion of the webinar. I will also take this moment to advise that today's session is likely to be a little longer than expected as we do have a lot of material to cover. But please remember if you do need to leave the webinar at any stage, you can always review the recording at any time. Webinars work best when they are interactive, so please don't be shy. We'd be delighted to address any questions along the way. Please type those into the questions box or into the chat at any stage of the presentation. Now it's with much excitement that I introduce today's speaker, which is of course my esteemed colleague here at our group, Peter Orman. Peter had significant involvement in the update of the guide and so it's fantastic that we could lock him in to deliver this webinar for you today. Peter, would you be as kind as to take our listeners through the specifics of what this two-part webinar uh, will cover? And welcome, by the way. <laughs> uh, and, and hello to everybody. What uh, the web, Today's webinar is, is session one of two sessions, and it covers the aspects of the guide that have, that have largely been updated. And that, so we focus on the new information particularly. And that new information is new to the Ostrodes Guide. Some of the information would have been contained in agency supplements. So some of you may find it uh, very familiar if you've already been using those agency supplements. And they could be agencies right across Australia or New Zealand. <coughs> now, to make sure everyone is, has access to the Ostrodes Guides, on this slide we're just showing where they are available. And, and uh, our practitioners in road agencies in Australia and New Zealand, and that includes local governments or councils, they can go to that website, austroads, at austroads.com.au for a login. And you must have a login to get access. You can't just go onto the website and download these documents. <coughs> Excuse me. So, as I said earlier, the webinar is in two sessions. The first session today will cover des design objectives, speeds and cross-section. And session two, which is next Tuesday, will do cover horizontal and vertical alignment and super-elevation. So, the content of today, just reverting back to today, we have design objectives, speeds and cross-section. Moving into a bit of detail on design objectives. There's a few areas covered and that had, has a, additional information. There's some general comments and I'll move to those shortly. Vulnerable road users, motorcyclists and emergency runaway strips. Some of the general objectives and this is to provide additional information and background material for designers. So what are your objectives in undertaking the design? Clearly the first one is to maximise safety and that's reinforced as one of the objectives in the, in the guide. We want operational efficiency and we want to maintain uniformity. That's road appearance uniformity and we want to develop efficient, economically efficient designs. We want to get the best outcome for the dollars we have available. We also need to provide future growth, so a consideration in design is the future growth. All road users, so an, an increased emphasis on catering for the needs of all road users. And we'll talk about a, a particular group in a moment, the motorcyclists. We want to minimise our environmental impacts 
and we want to take account of community views. And I'm sure each agency has their own practices and methods of obtaining and responding to community views, but it's becoming increasingly important across Australia and New Zealand. So a bit more detail of what's in the guide, what's been new on vulnerable road users. And vulnerable road users, what we're talking about in the main, pedestrians, cyclists and motorcyclists. So motorcyclists in particular, and the guide has included a new section covering motorcyclist considerations. And that's in a new table, table 2.1 that outlines some issues for good practice relating to motorcyclists. And I've just included on this slide part of that table. So this is not the whole table. This is just a part, so when you get to this in the guide, you're familiar with it. Hopefully recognise it straight away. <laughs> yes. So some of those issues are layout recognition. So what we want to do is avoid surprises of dangerous and dangerous combinations of the geometric elements, that's the horizontal vertical alignments. We want to maintain a high standard of delineation and pavement markings and we don't want to use curb colours or infrastructure colours that blend in, especially the traffic islands and protrusions. The harder they are to see, the harder it is for someone to detect and avoid these intrusions particularly. And motorcyclists have an issue at, on curves, so we want to avoid compound curves. And that's aimed at, at reducing or minimising the workload placed on the rider of the motorcycle. On curves also we provide a bit of lane widening as motorcyclists tend to lean into curves. And we provide shoulder area for a co opportunity for correction. And we'll talk about shoulders and ceiling of shoulders a bit later. Pavements. We also aim to shed the water, the surface water off the pavement as quickly, quickly as we can to minimise the potential for aquaplaning. At intersections and driveways, we don't want the drainage water in particular to wash gravel or debris onto the road surface and that probably applies everywhere. Whilst these uh, objectives were aimed at motorcyclists, you can see that many of them apply to all road users. There's a brand new section in the in the guide called emergency runway strips. It's covered briefly in section 2.2.8 and has a new appendix, appendix B, provides information relating to emergency runway strips on roads. Now these, these are really for remote areas where a one runway strip has not been provided and road access may not be available. And some of, the, some of the criteria I've just listed here, just pulled, listed three of the elements. Vertical design speed, you know, fairly high, a minimum seal width and a minimum length for these when, when we need to apply or have part of our road network act as an emergency runway strip. So this is a new section in the, in the guide. <coughs> Excuse me. The next section with uh, updates is the speeds, section three. So it's reinforcing the need for geometric consistency, which is very important for high speed rural freeways and highways particularly, where the posted speed limits are usually pretty high, 100, 110 kilometres an hour. And at the same time, we're trying to provide for driver expectations, so we don't want to surprise them. And these two photos here on this slideshow, the photo on the left 
the high speed rural road compared to the photo on the right, a low speed rural road. Now you can imagine the surprise someone might get without these warning signs. Here, yeah, so because this has needed to be constructed in this manner, the surprise is hopefully removed by these warning signs. Now, as a preference, you would design that out, but clearly in this case that can't be done, so it's needed some supplementary treatments. And our listeners will um, will come to understand over these these two sessions that that no surprise concept is a, is a recurring one and perhaps even the key message to be taken away, Peter? Yeah. Thank you. That's right, Angela. There's increased information on speed terminology. I've listed three here and desired speed so that's adopted by drivers on less constrained elements. The operating speed, the 50% of speed at which drivers will travel under free flowing, flowing conditions. The design speed, so that's what the designer has adopted for the design of each element of the road. And there is a fourth one called the posted speed limit. For the purposes of today, what we'll touch on perhaps more more about is these these three here. So understanding what each one is, and then what it's used for. And this little figure here shows how they are related. Across the top of this figure, we have the desired speed. So what the drivers will adopt under free flowing conditions. So this 100 and 110, that's flight travelling left to right, so in this direction. And the figures underneath, 100, 110 kilometres an hour and 100, is for the right to left travel along this type of road. Well, we know there's a bit of a broad description on each of these sections. And so taking into account we have a road environment and a reason and a geometric standard nominated there. And these operating speeds, so you can at these points along the road, you can see how the desired speed in this section where we have very good road alignment and good standard, the desired speed and the operating speed are similar, but when you get to some bends, some curves, it changes a bit. So this is the operating speed of the, the road. Now that then allows us to determine or set our design speed. So that's how desired speed, operating speed, leading to a design speed. That's how they are related. And the guide outlines all of this to really inform all the designers about the relationship between these speeds and why, why we need to know what each of them does and how they link together. One of the challenges for designers is determining this desired speed. And the guide has additional information about how you might do that, how you might determine what this desired speed is. So what we talk about in the guide is that on existing rural roads, we prefer to measure it. And if we're going to undertake measurements to determine it, this provides some guidance on, for a particular speed, how long a section we need to actually undertake these speed surveys. For new roads, the options are to review a road nearby road, which is very similar, and you might be able to do a survey. That would give you a guide on it. But if you can't do that on a new road, this new table, so table 3.2, 
provides a guide for what the desired speeds may well be. And generally you'll notice that this desired speed is generally 10 kilometres an hour above this posted speed limit. But this gives you a guide on the speeds, but it also gives you a guide on the, the curvature that will not reduce this desired speed. So some additional information on desired speeds contained within the guide. Uh, sorry, Peter, just before we move on to our cross-section section of the presentation, I'll just remind our listeners that this webinar is um, its here for you. We, we, we aim to clarify any points of confusion or any questions that you may have, so please don't be shy. Share with us any thoughts or feedback or, or comments you may have, and we'll make sure to address those as we go. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Angela. We'll move on to, on to cross-sections. There's a number of parts within the cross-section part of the guide that have been, has new information, amended information. It covers shoulders, verges, batters, down to white centerline treatments and bicycle treatments. So we'll cover all of those off over the course of this presentation. Some additional information discusses crown lines and their, one of their purposes. The key issue here shown on this one is really to, for drainage purposes. If you look at this sketch here, and these are contours, so as we travel down the road, the drainage path gets very long, that's I'm just around there, 95 metres. Now that might cause us some issues with aquaplaning. So to reduce the potential, this sketch below it introduces a crown line, so you can pick that up by the shape of these contours. And the flow path starting at the same point comes up but then flows back around. And you can see the, how the flow path has been greatly reduced. So one of the benefits of a crown for drainage purpose is to reduce these flow path widths. And this, this information has been incorporated now within the guide. On a two-way multi-lane road that's divided, you might need to introduce an offset crown for some reason. The sketch on my right, this undesirable method, what it does, you can see how the crown line, in this case, travels across the travelling lanes in a diagonal manner, introducing some awkward movements of vehicles if you travel along that. So that's, that is not the desirable method to incorporate this moving, getting the crown line from the centre to an offset crown line. The preferred way is shown on the left, where here's the crown line starting in the middle, in the median, and then it, if you pick up these contour lines, you'll see how the pavement shape is changing, by starting the crown here. So this is just a method to introduce an offset crown into a pavement. Medians, there's a lot of information, additional information on medians where the incorporation, so we're moving from an undivided road now to a, a road with a median in it because it's been found through recent research that the casualty crash rate is much higher on an undivided road than a divided road. It's 1.6 times higher than an under than a divided than an undivided road. So the benefits of a median have been identified, and now 
suggested in the guide to incorporate medians. And we'll talk about a couple of ways these are being incorporated later, the wide centerline median treatment and also on a narrow median incorporation of wire rope barriers. We'll talk about those a bit later. Peter, we do have a question here from Kathy. Um, do you mind addressing that now? Yeah. <laughs> Great. Kathy's asking or, or stating rather that uh, on the Bruce Highway in Queensland, uh, there are sections of this undivided road um, that has wider than usual centre lines. Um, has this been included as a design consideration in the guide update? Yeah, thanks Kathy for that question. Yeah, look, I just touched on um, the wide centre line treatment and this is something that has been put in place by a number of agencies already and now it's being imported and, tra and incorporated within the Austroad series for wider, wider application. So all road agencies now will be able to point to use the guide when they want to implement these types of treatments and we'll cover that a little bit more later in this presentation. Great, thank you and thank you Kathy, for engaging with us. Now I'll move on to some additional information on shoulders and again this is based on, on research over the last few years about the benefits of sealing shoulders, so not only providing shoulders but sealing them. Where, and the guide talks about all of this information to guide the designers on why we do things. Reducing runoff road crashes. If we sit, achieve with a shoulder seal of between half a metre to one and a half metres. What the research found also was that there was great safety benefits achieved up to one and a half metres. There were safety benefits achieved by going a bit wider, but the rate of increase of that safety benefit wasn't as great as the 0 to 1.5. So there's still benefits, but not as great. And the guide then talks about a wider shoulder, 2.5 to 3 metres. You may be able to justify that on a high speed, high volume road. So, so that's aimed at a little more opportunity for correction if the driver happens to travel off the through lanes. But clearly the benefits of shoulders and ceiling shoulders has been demonstrated and the guide now reflects that. Shoulders is on the outside of curves. And this work is based on some research undertaken in New South Wales by Stephen Levitt, who found that widening the shoulder on an outside curve, so just around here, so the outside of the curve, and this example shows a one metre shoulder being widened to 2.5 metres. There was significant safety benefits achieved by, by this, and what that allows is could look at it as a risk-based approach where if you can't provide these slightly wider shoulders everywhere but for example one metre here, then these locations here, on the outside of the curve, is where you may focus on providing a wider shoulder to enable the correction of the errant vehicle to happen. So you're giving the driver a, in a location that is known where drivers may wander off the through lane the outside of a curve and a greater opportunity to recover. And uh, Roger from our audience has uh, just made a comment here, publicly known as the breakdown lane, allowing space for stop vehicles. Thank you. That's the uh, wider shoulder, I gather, Roger. I and just yeah. a question here from David too. Thank you, David. Um, so David's asking, is this specifically for recovery and reducing speed before impact with a roadside object? particularly for motorcyclists? Um, now, I'm, I'm just not exactly sure what section David's referring to, but a, a wider shoulder, so if I, if, if I just go back, so everyone please excuse me, I'll just, I'll just go back here. So David, I gather we're talking about this slide here. 
let us know, David, if we've got the right slide there. Yes, yeah. Or, yeah, the safety benefit component of the shoulder, not the function of the shoulder. Yeah, so... Yes, well, this, this, these distances are aimed at safety. I haven't touched on the asset management benefit of shoulders, um, but certainly that that is a, an additional benefit of all of shoulders, whether they're sealed or unsealed, is to protect the, the pavement from damage with the shoulder providing support and drainage away from the from the pavement area. This these comments here are related to the safety benefits of providing that sealed shoulder and those widths. So I hope that, that deals with that one. Anyway, if David uh, needs some more information, um, I, I'd suggest I want to. I would like to move on so David can take that up separately. Maybe. Absolutely, get in touch with us uh, after the webinar, David. Thank you. All right, let's move on then. So we're still on cross section. We talk about verge slopes. And the guide's expanded its information on verge slopes where. We're talking about this section here, which is outside of the shoulder. So on this section here, we have the traffic lane, the shoulder, and the verge. And what we're discussing here is this, this section here, so outside of the shoulder. And what, what the guide suggests is maintaining that slope, particularly relating to this verge, at the same crossfall as your pavement. So this example shows crossfall from right to left. Now, if, if the pavement sloped the other way, the shoulder or the verge would slope similarly. What we're trying to do is minimise the vehicle interaction with changes of grades and slopes. And then as you move beyond the verge, you have this shoulder, this verge rounding would be put in here. And there's guidance on that, but that's been in the guide for some time. What's been added is some some additional sketches and diagrams of how these this section should be established. The guide reinforces the need for considerations when we're going through cut batters, fill batters about the stability and a, and a need to undertake analysis of the, those batters to ensure our batters are going to be stable enough to last our design time. And some of the things that you would check for, sliding, toppling and wedge failures. Now some, in Victoria in the last, month, last couple of months, we've had one of our significant tourist roads closed and I think even today it's still closed due to not necessarily one of these but due to the embankment or the batters actually uh, collapsing down onto the road pavement. Yeah, lots of um, <coughs> rock debris and, and things like that. So so the need to undertake this and, and no, I, I don't know exactly the circumstances of that one but what it does is reinforce the need to undertake this type of analysis as we do you have to deal with batters? There's an ad additional section on buns or mounds. So this is new information about placing the bund or the or a mound. And what, what they're used for is noise attenuation. So road, for example, road through lanes here and our reservation over this side, so providing a bit of noise attenuation. They can assist in the drainage of the road corridor. They also provide an opportunity for some landscaping. So this, the guide's been expanded to include a section, this is 4.5.3, on buns or mounds on roadside locations. You'll notice here that uh, we're suggesting these some slopes. 
three to one, that's three to one horizontal to vertical for landscaping purposes, but that slope may well depend on how you treat it. And you may need to consult with your horticultural experts on the appropriate slopes for maintaining these buttons or mounds. And that's an aspect that we as designers always need to consider is how will my creation be maintained. There's an expanded information on drainage and some of the factors we need to consider. And the, the whole purpose of drainage, of course, is to intercept and collect the runoff from the road formation or from the roadside areas. And here are some of the considerations. So part three, the Guide to Road Design, part three has been expanded to include these factors to be considered when we're dealing with drainage. This drainage aspect is also covered in another Austroads guide, the Guide to Road Design Part 5A, 5B, 5, 5A or 5B, where there's also a little more information than what's covered in Part 3 on roadside drains, types of drains, what they're used for and some materials. So, in it, so part Part three runs into part five of the guide to road design. And I've just thought I'll show some drainage and I was I was reflecting on the photos that this photo on my left was probably a Victorian table drain in about two thousand and nine compared to today, where we've had above average rainfall at and they're not the same table drains, by the way, but this showing a very green grassed, this is a swale drain showing what can be achieved on the roadside. Now there's a need for reinforcement of these swale drains, table drains, and most important on this diagram, which way do I slope this table drain when this is a fairly want to protect the pavement and the shoulder, so make sure this base is sloped away from the pavement. Most important, and that was one of the key issues that came out during a review as far as the drainage side so goes to away from the road pavement and shoulder. Urban median clearances, some additional information just where our travel lane is next to a curb or a raised median guide suggested for a road with a design speed less than or equal to 80. So we're talking largely about urban in this situation. Where it's lit, we don't apply any clearance between the travel lane and the, and the curb or median. If it's unlit, we allow half a metre clearance and this is due to the tendency of drivers to position their vehicles away from a, particularly a curb line. So we need to allow for that. So this is about driver behaviour. In a higher speed road, unlit and lit areas, the guide suggests these distances are a little different. Unlit areas increases to a metre. And in a lit area, we still want to establish this dist uh, di distance between the, the uh, 
edge line, the curb line and, and the travel line of half a metre. Median widths. The median width or reco and recovery area Gosh, we talk about medians wider than 15 metres, they're still common. But what was found that where the median up to 20 metres and beyond 20 metres, it wasn't further reductions in crashes achieved when you went to 20 metres or wide. Now th this may be problematic with the introduction of narrower meetings and some of the treatments that we'll talk about soon about, you know, and clearly it's the available land space is one of the drivers on, on both uh, roadside widths and median widths. But the guide, if there is an amendment to Table 415, it's an update from the 2010 edition. This recovery area has been increased from 15 to 20 metres. So you should pick that up if you have a look at this table, 4.15. Now we spoke about white centre line treatments and narrow medians earlier. And the guide's been expanded with some information on wire wrap safety barriers and narrow medians. So here's an example of that. So a narrow median wire rope barrier. Just as an adjunct you can see this white line to curb. The offset I spoke about earlier is dem actually demonstrated in this photo. So there's a whole new appendix E which provides information on narrow medians with wire rope safety barriers. Some of the design elements that we need to consider are the minimum length, the curvature, so vertical curvature and horizontal curvature, so the guide suggests vertical curvature greater than 3,000 metre radius and the horizontal curvature has got to be greater than a 200 metre radius curve. We also need to allow some space behind the barrier for deflection. Wire wrap barriers can deflect a fair, fair way, so you need to consider that. If I go back to that narrow median, that might depend on a risk base where if a vehicle takes full deflection of your wire wrap barrier may well end up in the travel lane. And I certainly that was the practice undertaken in Sweden when these were introduced some years ago, but they assessed that and found that based on a risk-based approach with the traffic volumes on that particular road, they could tolerate that action. But when we're designing, we need to make sure we have considered that and considered have we space that I'm, I would like to have behind the barrier. Peter, a question has come through from Gavin and the question reads, is there guidance on the deflection of a wire rope barrier? <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse me. Oh, that's all right. Let me repeat that. So, um, is there guidance on the deflection of a wire rope barrier? Well, that, that would depend on the, on the design of the wire rope barrier. Um, so, what, what, have you design, what have you catered for? Um, I think the, the relevant issue is is not necessarily, or the first instance, not how far will a wire, wire rope barrier deflect, but what deflection can I tolerate? And then going back to saying, well, I need to design a barrier to cater for that deflection, or I need to cater for that, that deflection. So, so in essence, you, you would need to go back to the design of that.
or regarded as adequate space behind the barrier for deflection? Um, I think I think I just answered that. <laughs> but well, no, just to, just to restate restate what the issue there is is what what space have you got available? What deflection can I tolerate? Because all our road cross sections will have different considerations, different requirements, because we'll have different land spaces, we might have greater constraints in one area or another. And also what risk am I prepared to accept? So if I deflect the barrier, and this applies to really any barrier, if I deflect into an, an opposing line, can I tolerate that or not? That's a designer's decision. Well, there you go. Thank you, Gavin and Caroline. And if you did want to discuss that in more detail, please feel free to um, contact us after the webinar. All right. were first introduced. There was the maintenance staff of each road agency were up in arms about the need to maintain these things, and of course, our, our we have matured in in all of our infrastructure since those early days where we're placing them to try and avoid, in some cases anyway, you know, the minimal contact disrupts, but we're also better at recognising the need, the availability of materials. So that aside, we still need to take account of maintenance practices. So I'll move on to the white centerline treatments that we spoke about that Cathy asked about on the Bruce Highway earlier. So the guide's been expanded and I've shown here a just a normal design domain example of what the, the guide's been expanded to include. Where we have this wide centre line which is set here at a metre with some cross sections to match it with a total seal width. So there's, there's some new guidance on providing the, the white centre line treatment. And I thought it would be worthwhile just showing that the guide has considered how do we deal it with white centre lines of treatment. So there's a, a figure in there that shows how this white centre line may transition into a intersection with a with a turning lane and then back on the departure side of the intersection back to the one metre wide centre line treatment. So the guide is helping the designers about how that might occur and how they might set it up in the, into their design. And there's some examples of some wide centre line treatments. And just to restate, this is a new Appendix F in the guide. So you can see there's just two illustrations of, of how that white centre line treatment may be set up. And, and the third one. <coughs> Excuse me. Poor Peter, that voice of yours, how is it going? <laughs> Getting there. Um, thank you everyone. Just as I thought that we wouldn't get any questions, we got inundated. So there you go, what an active audience we ended up having. Um, there's quite quite a number that we haven't addressed here, so I might just, um, maybe we'll cover a few more slides because we don't have many left until the end of the presentation and then we'll, um, we'll try and take as many questions at the end. Peter, would that work? <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm sure it would. The guide, the guide contains a little bit of more information on bicycle lanes, and, and I've included some information that is in the current, in the 2010 edition of the guide, just to reinforce some of the issues. Because on-road cycling, I'm sure it's topical. It's topical in Melbourne, particularly, and I'm sure it's topical in every other major city in in Australia and New Zealand. I mean, how do we provide for them on on roads now? i just restate where the part three deals with on-road bicycle lanes. The off-road bicycle lanes and are covered in another Austro's guide, the Guide to Road Design Part 6A, which has been under review 
over the last 12 months and is near, nearing its completion. But coming back to part three, we are talking about on-road bicycle lanes. So some of the things we need to consider are here, the cross-section of the road, what traffic management programs we have in place, and the maintenance programs that might provide an opportunity to provide space for cyclists. Another thing that we need to be cognizant of is the other guides and I've included here by way of to show an example of how the design guides interact with the traffic management guide. So this is, this is a figure out of the guide to traffic management, that's the GTM guide to traffic management, part four and it's a 2016 edition so it's only newly out, which shows a volume, vehicle volume, so from low to high, a vehicle speed, so we're talking about motor vehicle from low to higher, and what type of treatment would be considered. Now this is, as just to restate, this is not in the guide to road design, this is in the guide to traffic management, but there's a need to be cognizant of the linkages between the Austroads guide that are used to inform each other. One of the goals of Austroads is to not unnecessarily replicate information within guides and that's why we need to have, retain and have these cross references. So what we're trying to achieve and reinforce in the guide, particularly on bicycle safety, is a separation to improve safety and how you might achieve that. There's three ways nominated there, line marking, painted separator strips and delineators and raised islands and there's just an example of how separation may be achieved. This example shows a parking lane and it shows the separation from the through lane. And I just thought it would be worth showing an example of another separated bicycle lane. This one's been separated use of these traffic islands. There's also information, additional information on providing contraflow bicycle lanes and there's two examples here how that they might be established. The one photograph on my left, this one here, bicycle lane and then the opposing flow actually comes up that carry that road. And the photo on the right, you can see it's an entry in the intersection. We have a bicycle lane coming in the opposite direction to the vehicles entering. So the guide suggests that where we have these contra Flow, desirably one metre wide with a 600 millimetre minimum. Now on some of, those, some of those photos I showed earlier, there's green surfacing. That, and I would defer you to road agency policy where the road agency figure here is already, so what we have here is a bicycle and a car parking line, so parking, the bicycle line down here and we have, it's labelled here a safety strip, it's a separator, separation area and you can see the impact if we don't cater for the issues of car doors opening onto passing cyclists. So this is included to reinforce the need for our road designers and traffic engineers to 
care for the cyclists along with In some locations you might need to consider some protective treatments and the guide discusses some methods of achieving that. And some of the considerations you would take are uh, the radius, sight distance, the traffic characteristics, so trucks, buses, speeds, volumes, the geometry, so the lane widths, and even the encroachment of traffic into any existing bicycle lane. So again, the guide has just expanded the information it contains on catering for bicycles on a road. And here we are at the end of the presentation. So Peter, I'll let you have a drink of water while I, um, I'll start um, sending some of these questions over to you and, and thank you to our wonderful audience for engaging with us. Um, we do apologise if we don't address all of the questions and in fact we I trust we won't, but uh, if there are any burning questions that you have that we haven't been able to address, please check in with us after the webinar and we'll aim to help you as much as possible. So Ian sent through a question relating to um, contraflow bike lanes and so he's asking what about for low volume and low speed roads, um, is there no lane needed? Any comments on that? Um, well I'd, I'd have to check exactly but thinking about that in the in the broad where you have opposing flows of traffic you would need, you would I'd preferably have some separation between the opposing flows. So, so defining the the where both flows will go, I think. Okay, question here from Jess. Jess is asking any design guidance for constrained situations for bicycle lane provision. Yes, the um, a, a terribly difficult one. There's minimum minimum widths within the within the guides. Um, my only comment to you is, and this might depend on how constrained the constrained situation is, and and I know in some, particularly in inner parts of our major cities, some of these constrained sites uh, are unable to meet the guidelines. And so the view that uh, has been taken in some of these agencies, and particularly councils, is is it better to have something or nothing? Now that's a decision that will depend on the site. So, you know, is there a minimum width in a constrained situation? Well, there's minimum width within the guide, but what are the other factors that you need to consider? Do I provide something or not? Now, the other issue to keep in mind is these are guidelines. They're not standards. So guidelines inform you to make a decision. And the decisions all yours. Uh, that's the designer's <laughs> responsibility. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. I just says thank you, Peter. So thank you, Jess, for engaging with us. Hopefully, we've clarified that for you. Uh, Rogers asked a question. Now, this did come in much earlier on in the presentation when we discussed uh, design speed, and the question reads: uh, Is there a mathematical relationship for use in lower speed environments, for example, 40 to 50 kilometer per hour urban situations? Um, I'm not sure exactly what I think. Can Roger, would you mind um, just expanding on that? I, in relation, to that, I need the context. Absolutely, and and sorry that question would have been handy earlier on when you were actually talking about that. But no, if you can, but yeah. if I allow Roger to a bit of time on that, and I'll, I'll just comment on on one of the um, one of the challenges for designing in low speed environments is that. When you look at all the charts and graphs and guidance we have within the Austrade series, generally they taper down to 40 or 50 kilometres an hour, and, and you're sort of getting to sort of one end of the of the spectrum, so to speak. Whereas the guides have largely been developed around the arterial type road, so a higher speed, typically with higher volumes, and so the lower volume, the lower speed roads. There is a bit of a gap in our knowledge. Now, there, there are some 
some older information. I think, and I'm testing my memory on this, <laughs> Roger, at the minute, but um, there was a, a guide put out back in the 1990s, I think by Laurie Comerford, about designing urban low-speed roads. Um, but if if you want, I, it's not within the current guide because it, it sort of tapers off at that lower speed range without without expanding that guidance. And that's something I can I could probably have a search for uh, Roger if he if he would like to see if I can one find any of those documents. But the Ostrich guides tend to focus on the arterial type road or the the freeway motorway standard. Yeah, so Roger just went on to say, um, relating to curve radius versus lane width, so to put his question into context, oh, yeah. okay. um, and then he went on to, to further comment, we're still bound to follow uh, Osteroid's guides when submitting design to asset authorities, so low speed environments are something required. Yep, yeah. yeah. so, so in, the, in the curve and uh, horizontal radius issue, it may well be the types of vehicles that are tracking around those curbs. So, so again, the the uh, outer edges of the vehicle crossing, I'll call them centre lines, but you may not have a centre line, but into the opposing travel lane. Can that be tolerated or not? Um, but again, the challenges we face at these lower speeds is the guidance. There isn't a significant amount of guidance to help us, and so the way I would approach it would be looking at things like the vehicle turning templates, because we're talking about low speeds anyway, mm -hmm. less, you know, the 40 k's area. What, what road space are they occupying for the radius that I, I would like to, to build there? What, what's the traffic volumes? What's the risk that I'm now being exposed to? Great. Well, we, we hope you found that useful, Roger. Thank you for sending that through. Um, question here from Todd, and again, uh, going a little bit uh, back to the Verges Slope uh, related slides. So he's asking, doesn't having the Verges Slope back towards the roadway increase the likelihood of emissions? Yes. It in theory, the verge typically on that example I showed uh, wasn't very wide, and you also might select a, a different material because you, you still have the shoulder there. But yeah, it's a consideration that needs to be undertaken when you're determining the surface treatment of that verge, because you don't want the material washing onto your shoulder really or the pavement, because that's that causes another issue for the travel the through the vehicles travelling along the lanes with different surface materials. Um, but again, it'll be tr how do you treat that verge? How do you maintain that verge to try and avoid that happening? What what the slope is aimed at is to try and um, minimise the the vehicle action. Is it we're talking because we're talking an errant vehicle here in travelling into the air zone that they may well be able to correct themselves if they if their vehicle isn't being made un, a little less stable by these vertical di differences. Stay back and take a couple of more questions. So I do apologise. We will go past the yes. Now, just as a friendly reminder, Peter, maybe pop it to the last slide, which I think has got your contact details on there, in case some um, people do need to get in touch with us uh, once the webinar has concluded. So uh, Peter's details right there. Uh, a question here from Stephen. Um, this one's relating to curbs. Would clearance to curbs also be applied to non-medium curb alignment? Yeah. So, so a non-medium, I take it to be the outer edge. I call it the in our in Australia, well, the left side edge. Yeah. Well, as the, the the concept is the driver behaviour trying to avoid a vertical edge, I suppose, in terms of looking at a curve. And I know there's rollover curves. And, and so, so the concept is similar. Um, often, though, on the, on the um, 
outer edges of Kerbin channels, so there's a little bit of but, but think of the concept of why we're providing it and it's to it's because driver behaviour tends to shy away from these vertical edges and so take up a little more road space than what we planned and hence in, may impact upon the capacity of the road and operation of the road. Great, thank you for that Stephen. I hope we've clarified that for you. Another question per hour and no lighting. Is a 300 millimeter offset to the median acceptable? Uh, we spoke about um, half a meter to one lit. Now, this is this is a risk-based decision. Again, I, I would draw you to the lower speed, and and I can't advise you on this because I'm I'm moving into an area that I can't. I can't deal with in this context, <laughs> no, because it's um, the only thing I can point you towards is what's in the guide, which is the unlit suggests half a metre to a to a, a median or a curb, curb edge. Again, my comments about the guide it's, uh, we have a bit of a gap in in our design guidance once we move into those types of roads. So I can't I can't answer your question. Okay. Well hope for asking us if the old urban road design and rural road design guides are or have been replaced by part three. So is that the case, Peter? Yes, those those guides. I think they were produced around in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. um, the also the subsequent guides in Australia have actually been developed from those, and in, including other information. Clearly, in part replicated within the guide series, not necessarily all in part three, but across across other guides as well. But they are still, I still find them useful as when you're wanting to just check something, you want to reinforce in your own mind about an approach to something, that if you have access to those guides, um, you may find a little more information in those. But generally, the information has been translated into subsequent Australia's guides. So are they obsolete then? Or yeah, they, they are obsolete. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, thank you, Gavin. Oh, he goes on to mention 2002. So maybe not 1990 something. Yeah, but but two, yeah. yeah, okay. Thank you, Gavin. All right, uh, we might take one more question and um, we'll call it a day. Um, so thank you everyone once again for all of those wonderful questions and I'm, I'm sorry that we're not going to be able to address them all today, but uh, one last one to see us through to the end and this one's been sent through by Craig. Craig's asking, are Unsealed Roads going to be addressed by any of the guides as these generally address sealed roads only? There is some information on unsealed roads and again we'll get into um, an area and, and I think an ARB uh, member George Giamara some time ago produced an unsealed road guide that is I find useful particularly for the lower volume unsealed roads. which is um, the current guides in, in the Austroads do, do cover unsealed roads but perhaps not to the same extent. So there is information on unsealed roads and we'll probably talk a little bit more about unsealed roads in session two when we talk about things like coefficients of deceleration. Great, thank you Peter and thank you for those questions. I'm sorry that we've run out of time and we can't address them all, all today but um, if there are any burning questions that you know once again they just cannot wait, please do check in with Peter, I'm sure he'll be happy to assist you. Now, on that note, I'll bid you all farewell and look forward to seeing you or speaking with you uh, this time next Tuesday. Thank you for joining us today.
And as the webinar closes down, ladies and gentlemen, you will see a survey pop up on your screen. If you could kindly let us know how we travelled today or if there is anything that you'd like to know more about, you can leave those details with us. The, the survey is just a, a few questions long, so it won't take long at all. Thank you once again uh, on behalf of Austroads and we'll see you next week.